If anyone was aware of the true extent to which fairies played a major role in the, let it be said, highly irregular recovery of Gwen's stolen wedding ring from Mexico, it was Helen's young daughter, Blaze. It was the child, after all, who had secretly solicited the fairy's help in the first place when she had gone to the meditation garden with a natural spring-fed lake, accompanied by her mother on the pretense of feeding the swans. This somewhat unorthodox solicitation for aid had been prompted by a visit to Dr. Natalie Dubois for a first-ever dental exam, in which the child had found herself in the unusual position of staring up and into Natalie's mesmerizing sapphire bindi as the dentist poked and prodded in the child's widely open mouth. Thanks to the excellent tutelage of her godmother, Alice, Blaze was well aware of the tiny jewel's enormous significance, and she watched it sparkling between the dentist's eyebrows with keen interest. Somehow, the more she stared into the glittering gem, the more affinity she felt for this whimsical stranger, who seemed to be equally enthralled with the peering into Blaze's mouth, while at the same time smelling pleasantly of peppermint toothpaste. At one point in the course of the exam, when Dr. Dubois chanced to call her patient Blaze, the child felt compelled to take Natalie into her confidence. My name is Crescent, she whispered conspiratorially. I used to be a cat. Without missing a beat, Dr. Dubois replied apologetically, I stand corrected, Crescent. By the way, my name is Marie Antoinette. I used to be a queen. Suitably impressed, Blaze went on to show off a little golden ring she wore with a sapphire center that had once been Alice's mother's baptismal ring. Natalie, continuing gaily on with the game, feigned jealousy, and while brushing away a mock tear, said she wished she had a ring like that one too. Blaze explained how the ring had once been stolen by the fairies but they had given it back after the child had done them a special favor. Then she solemnly promised to use her influence to get the fairies to bring another ring just like it for Dr. Dubois. When another ring just like it did materialize strangely enough and was brought back to Natalie, by what some might prefer to call a circuitous coincidence, but what others, like the barrel-chested monastic with the Gaelic accent, preferred to call the operation of laws of nature known only to the fairies. It seemed to be a fait accompli. It seemed remained <clears throat> it remained only for Alice to recognize the ring on Natalie's finger at a subsequent teeth cleaning and to explain its true provenance for the dentist to realize that she could not in, keep, in good faith keep it and must return to its rightful owner, but only on the condition that credit, in the process, be given where credit was due, which in this case, of course, was to the fairies. Knowing how close the bond was between Dr. Dubois and Blaise, Elena seriously contemplated if the child should be told about the dentist's sudden passing at all. I don't know how she'll take it, Helena, fretted over a basket of pommes frites and a glass of vouvray at the Mamiton, with Alice several days after her friend's disclosure regarding the, the discovery of the perplexing photograph. They were extraordinarily close. Which is precisely why you must tell her, Alice, wisely counseled her friend while musing upon the irony, that she should be a, the one encouraging Elena to be truthful. Taking a sip of Ouvray, Alice then glanced discreetly across the street to make a mental note of the film that was playing at the Arrow Theater. Jean Cocteau's Beauty and the Beast lay emblazoned boldly across the theater marquee, causing Alice to lament the fact that Blaze was not of age when she could easily read subtitles. Otherwise, a matinee of the magical classic as told through the sensitive, yet ominous, imagination of Cocteau would be the perfect pre pretext upon which to enact the idea that Alice had been formulating. Oh well, <clears throat> perhaps a tried and true trip to the Santa Monica Pier for a carousel ride would be more conducive backdrop anyway for what Alice had in mind. I'll tell her if you like. Alice then preferred tentatively, even as Elena eagerly pounced upon this unexpected gift from the gods. Would you please? Helen replied thankfully, understanding for perhaps the first time in her life what Emily Dickinson advocated when she had recommended that one should tell all the truth, but tell it slant. 
Besides, Helena never failed to understand the degree to which Blaze genuinely listened to Alice, and without any of the histrionics, children seemed to reverb strictly for the benefit of their mothers. I just don't want her to be upset, she added on a more plaintive note. And so it was arranged that Alice would pick up Blaze on Saturday afternoon, ostensibly to go for a ride on the carousel at Santa Monica Pier, where Alice would, at some auspicious moment, broach the subject of Natalie Dubois' demise, and for the benefit of the child, in the gentlest of terms possible. The auspicious moment arrived almost reverentially, while Alice and Blaze were quietly sitting on a bench at the furthest end of the pier, quite far from the loud and energetic choruses that bellowed forth from the carousel's antique Cleope, and that tended to favor of the waltzes of Richard Strauss's or Lehar's overture, The Merry Widow. As they sat facing Catalina Island, which lay all but visible in the distance, languidly draped in a thick shroud of mist, they had finished a voluminous wand of pink cotton candy and were listening to the melancholic strains of a lone violinist who sweetly pay, played the dying swan by St. Saul's. The ghost of Pavlova herself could almost be discerned gracing the deserted pier with its own haunting presence as she delicately executed her most heartbreaking and justly famous dance for no one in particular. It was while riveted on this phantom performance that Blaze thoroughly surprised Alice by broaching the impending subject first. Natalie's dead, she whispered hoarsely. Did you know? Why, yes, I did, Alice answered awkwardly, all but tripping over her own words. Jean-Noël tell you? Blaze asked through squinted eyes as if she fully expected as much. Expected as much? He did, as a matter of fact, Alice said, acknowledging Blaze's hunch to have been the correct one. That's good, because my mom won't tell you. She knows, but she won't even tell me. Blaze now bit her lower lip in an effort. It seemed to be holding back tears. Your mom's just trying to protect you. It's because she loves you very much, Alice said. How did you find out? I saw it with my third eye, Blaze stated simply. A glooming silence then ensued between the two of them, during which time the pensive quality of the music caused Alice to think deeply of how she and her own mother had sometimes shielded each other from the truth, and quite often much to the detriment of their relationship. It caused Blaze, however, to ponder deeply on the constancy of the fairies, and how they, at least, could always be counted upon to deliver on their promises. The most recent proof of their unerring dependability had been in their procurance for the child, and by their usual circuitous means of curious drawing that had been long enchanted her, entitled The Crow's Funeral. It depicted a straight line of six crows standing upright in solidarity as one of their fallen brethren lay prostrate before them with eyes tightly shut. As the image flashed across her mind, it had prompted Blaze to break the silence by saying, I think we should have a funeral. We will, Alice reassured her, at the meditation garden with the natural spring-fed lake, just as soon as Zuzu comes next month from France. Zuzu? Blaze asked blankly. That's Natalie's mother. She lives in Paris. Oh, was all the child said. Meanwhile, Pavlova, after all these years, it seemed, had not lost her touch. Spontaneous tears began to well up in Blaze's eyes. In Alice's, they were not long in coming. As usual, by the time the great ballerina had left the stage, there was not a dry eye in the house. <laughs>